first speaker, uh, Natalie Marx, USA. A duplex arterial mapping continues to be the best diagnostic imaging quality in diabetic patients. Uh, please, I would like to announce that uh, we will postpone the questions till the end of the session. And we will, uh, and the audience will uh, uh, forward the me the questions by scanning this QR code on the screen and send the questions via WhatsApp uh, to me. And I will, on their behalf, ask the speakers uh, the questions uh, they asked. Thank you. Please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be a um, participant in the conference and a great responsibility to open. Uh, I hope I stand up to the challenge. Um, my only disclosure is I think the duplex scanner is the best modality for arterial disease diagnosis, obviously in skilled hands. Uh, there are certain limitations to conventional arteriography, its cost, and a recent something we did not know about, shortages of contrast. It's a worldwide shortage because of the COVID and it's hard to find it even in the United States. It's really uh, hard to make somebody repeat the arteriography frequently. Uh, there's only given morphological information and a uh, technique of angioplast angiograph uh, gives a limited projection and it's not sensitive to pseudo occlusions. It misses up to 70%. Uh, there are multiple complications, local uh, and systemic. I'm gonna um, uh, describe just some of them. Uh, we did a small study on uh, 145 patients before 180 bypass procedures, with majority of them being diabetics and uh, almost 90% having diabetes or renal failure. And preoperative contrast arteriography was deemable in, uh, was needed in patients um, in 12% of the cases because majority we did with ultrasound, and mostly due uh, due to poor runoff or non-visualization of the arteries. And 43% of these patients had increase of creatinine for more than 0.5 milligram of decaliter, and post-angiogram creatinine was over 1.5 in 43%. And this is with very low amount of contrast, and uh, patients were well prepped and hydrated before the angiogram. And three out of three patients uh, had who had uh, renal failure before and uh, diabetes, uh, they developed a significant increase in uh, creatinine after. Uh, there are multiple drawbacks to MR, but I'm gonna leave it up to my colleagues uh, that will follow me during the session, and also the CT. So we think that it's a long contraindication list, uh, sensitivity to gadolinium, uh, cost availability on a stat basis, and also radiation and hand co contrast load uh, make this not the favorite modalities. And essentially, they are glorified luminographies. They give very little information about morphology of the arteries. On the other hand, duplex arteriography is cheap, non-invasive, if it could be done repeated, mobile, it assesses head to toes, it gives us imaging of arterial wall and gives a tremendous amount of hemodynamic information and is extremely sensitive to low flow and I'm gonna emphasize it multiple times. Although there are some limitations, it's very operator dependent, it gives us limited field of view, it requires a certain amount of patient cooperation, it has technical limitations. Our biggest enemy is the calcium, and there are plenty of calcium in the arteries, especially intrapopliteal arteries and foot arteries and diabetics. These are just examples of these calcifications. Uh, this is our experience with a thousand of pre-bypass um, angio, uh, we call it duplex arteriographies without contrast, when 93% uh, of these patients uh, were performed uh, procedures without any contrast, and 7%, 72 cases required addition of contrast arteriography. Almost half of these patients were diabetics, and it's obvious they are the ones who needed to have bypasses. Our protocol includes the use of all possible um, configurations of the probes for imaging of various arteries. I'm not gonna um, dwell too much on it, but we use systolic velocity ratio of two to identify 50% stenosis and three to identify 70% stenosis. Uh, we have a lot of options. Whenever there's iliac severe disease or occlusion, we could easily look into the contralateral uh, disease to f find the inflow. Uh, whenever there is aortic disease or occlusion, bilateral extensive iliac disease or iliac occlusion, periligament lesions and critical iliac stenosis, we could easily go up to the upper extremities to find inflow in the subclavian or outer ax axillary segment. Uh, the duplex scan allows us to very accurately uh, see the acute embolization, like in this case, from distal external to common femoral artery. 
And this is a acute occlusion of the SFA overlying severe disease. And we could uh, easily distinguish it with the duplex, while any other luminographies will show us just occluded arteries. And we could say that this is a chronic occlusion. Again, you cannot tell it on the CAT scan. Um, a lot of imaging with the contrast miss thrombose popliteal aneurysms, like in this case, is a large aneurysm that was not seen on the um, arteriogram. And we can also identify small popliteal aneurysms. They look benign because they're small, but we've shown uh, previously in our publications that when they have neural thrombus, like in these, they have high potential for embolization and uh, severe complications. Uh, we could find the patent artery versus occluded one based on the adjacent veins. Uh, this is occluded posterior tibial ankle with the patent veins. And we can uh, also find a good arterial segment. On the left side, you see a soft wall of the posterior tibial artery in the ankle. On the right, it's extremely calcified, and it's not a good target vessel for recanalization. Uh, we could find uh, where the embolus starts precisely. Like in this case, we found that the embolus was actually in the dorsalis pedis artery, while the angiogram in this case showed that the entire anterior tibial artery was occluded. We can better find tibial artery uh, suitable for the distal uh, revascularization target. And uh, uh, this is the foot artery, plantar artery with a very low flow, uh, less than three centimeter per second was patent on the ultrasound while it was occluded on angiogram. And when we need to have find the conduit, we can easily switch to the venous imaging and find ipsilateral contralateral GSV, SSV, uh, we could find the arm veins, and we could see if they're suitable or not to use the conduit. As you see in the images, there are some intra-wall um, thrombus or it even calcified vein in patients with diabetes and renal failure. All this information is gathered in the um, drawing, and which shows everything, patent arteries, occluded arteries, not visualized arteries. We could also do the uh, mapping of the saphenous vein and show it on this image. And this is another one, quite extensive uh, disease, multiple failed bypasses, and the only vessel is this dorsalis pedis, which is soft, and it was also occluded on the angiogram. And you see the ultrasound showed the big systolic velocity of 2.3, well below threshold of any other imaging, CT, MR, or angiogram. We could find uh, not only the good target vessel, we could mark it on the, screen, on the skin, and this is the skin mark in the uh, operating area, and then the bypass that is uh, performed exactly to the target vessel. There are some limitations for uh, uh, usually gas obesity when the arterial segments are not visualized well. For the SFA and the popliteal, again, the calcification is repeated offense, and also the T-bills. In 2% of the cases, we could not visualize uh, the T-bills because of these uh, problems. Average time is about 55 minutes, a little long, but once you um, get uh, more agile with the imaging, uh, this could be cut. Uh, in conclusion, the majority, up to 93% uh, in skilled hands of lower extremity revascularization procedures can be safely planned based on duplex angiography alone. And when severe calcification is noted, uh, imaging with the duplex may not be reliable and other modalities need to be used. Knowledge of surgical anatomy, appreciation of operating team strategies, excellent technical skills, and dedication on necessary qualities for the vascular ultrasonographer or physician in uh, performing duplex arteriography. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice presentation. I would like to call the second speaker, Dr. Vasila Taha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. And I'm deeply thankful to Professor Ahmad Taha for the kind invitation. I'm truly honored to be today among such stellar faculty. My topic here about the duplex ultrasound and diabetic foot patients, a safe modality with resilient challenges. I have no disclosure. Uh, we have a typical daily scenario. We have a critical limb ischemia in diabetic patient, bounding popliteal artery, so the popliteal artery is intact, and no distal pulsations with elderly, fragile patients, borderline kidney function tests, and we do re request CT and geography. You know how much is the dose of the contrast? 150 ml, and this is a really very harmful scenario for our patients. 
Moreover, in a systematic review and meta-analysis, they saw the sensitivity and specificity dropped when we are going from proximal to distal. So we are talking that tibial arteries in some reviews dropped till 40% sensitivity. But still, we have a challenge. This is a diabetic uh, foot, and we don't know if it's ischemic foot or not, the degree of ischemia if it is ischemic, and the underlying causative lesions. In fact, high quality of duplex is the, uh, relying all the answers you needed. But there is a challenge, and the challenge by this scientist. Mückenberg, who described in 1903 the calcific medial sclerosis, and this is a very typical challenging uh, scenario for the operators of duplex, despite all the distinguished uh, old journals and articles, they pointed that these calcifications, they, these lesions are best detected by duplex ultrasound. There is still a challenge by the heavy calcifications. And in the few coming uh, minutes, I will share with you some tips how to uh, surpass and overcome such a challenge. First of all, examine your patient. And you are a believer in angiosome theory. The lesion itself will tell you the, indirectly what is the territory and what is the artery uh, affected. And the tip number two, uh, go from distal to proximal. If you are have, uh, very sure that there are popliteal intact pulsations, go distal. You spare your time and you spare your effort and you are very fresh. Start with the PCE, for example, retromalular and or even the plantar branch. And another tip for the anterior tibial artery is the echogenic line of the chain of the tibia. Go also from distal to proximal and don't don't forget the ostium. We do, um, it's very precious when we do an endovascular procedures. This uh, stump is spared. It's a very valuable adding uh, information by uh, the duplex. In the vast majority, the ETA could be occluded, severely diseased, but also in vast majority, this stump is spared. And also the dorsalis pedis artery could be a ta good target vessel as uh, mentioned by uh, Professor Marx. And, um, and good uh, reporting about the dorsal pedis artery or the plantar artery, it could be of very uh, high benefit for the vascular surgeon. Another challenge is the peroneal artery. This is the most challenging. And here we have um, put your gel along the uh, artery. And how to detect the artery? It's an imaginary line between the lateral third and the medial two thirds. And we go from distal to proximal. And don't forget in this lesion, this is typical in the territory of the peroneal artery according to the angiosome theory. So it's very important to thoroughly interrogate the peroneal artery in this scenario. Another tips with the color mode. We have dealing with a low status flow. So we have to drop our low velocity scale as lower as you, as you we can, and this is an example of dynamic flow. In the recent scanners, we have the dynamic flow, and this is the beauty of the duplex, because with the dynamic flow, we can have a high penetration power to get such a low flow status. And this is a very uh, different example of PTE. The first one here, it's, um, not sure if it's a pointer. Yes. The first one is quite uh, patent with the, the vena comitente on each side of the artery. The second example with mild irregularities, the third with calcification with posterior acoustic shadow, and another example with total occlusion but the plantar artery is uh, spread. Increase the color green is another tip. Uh, don't condemn an arterial, um, uh, arterial segment occluded before detected the artery uh, between the two vena comitente. Another tip, before condemned the artery is occluded, try to get the tracing of the Doppler spectrum. Here in this example, the Doppler spectrum uh, tracing a very low, very low, low status, 14.2 centimeter per second, and the still the artery is uh, patent. Another tip by Doppler spectrum is to calculate the uh, hemodynamic uh, assessment by uh, the tail of velocity, peak systolic velocity and diastolic velocity and the ratio. And the ratio here, we are talking about the RI or receptivity index, which is the equation systole minus diastole and uh, over divided by the systole. So the variable here is the diastolic component. It's very important, the RI, and here at very recent uh, publication, September, so this month, uh, 2022, there are linear correlation, direct correlation between the high resistivity index and the long-standing uh, diabetes and with the high uh, hemoglobin A1C. 
uh, this is, both of them are monophasic Doppler waveforms. What are the difference? The difference is here, the diastolic component. What does it mean? Does it mean that the foot is more or less has certain collateralization, certain uh, foot uh, vessels? But look to this one, it's a very high uh, resistance with high resistivity. Index. What does it mean? It means that on the foot, this is on the distal uh, or the ankle level, it means it reflects the high resistance, the peripheral resistance, so the foot is desert or there is incomplete pedal arch. What does it mean? In direct revascularization, we are, all, of, all of us, we are very familiar by the direct, uh, the, the target vessel or indirect revascularization. If we are doing indirect revascularization and we have a complete uh, plantar or pedal arch, this means the wound healing and the limb salvage rate will be much higher. So uh, my take home message here, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, identification of the artist is very important from distal, from, uh, distal to proximal, the chain of tibia for the anterior tibial artery, uh, look to the spared stump and the peroneal artery, which is very challenging artery, lateral decuples, imaginary line between the third lateral and the two uh, third medial, low velocity scale, increase the color gain, dynamic flow, and then competency before condemned the, the artery is occluded or not. Doppler spectrum is very important, but the analysis, the sensitivity index can predict the integrity of the pedal arch and the degree of ischemia. And we have published more than two decades now, and we have the critical uh, ankle peak systolic velocity at the threshold of 25 centimeters per second. And this is calculated by the mean of the peak systolic uh, velocity, uh, posterior tibial and anterior tibial at the ankle level. The threshold for critical limb ischemia, 25 centimeters per second. Uh, I would like to uh, invite all of you to join uh, the World Congress of International Union of Phlebology in a few weeks in Istanbul, and we have a great Egyptian contribution. We have the Egypt-Africa section uh, by Ivla, uh, conducted by Dr. Rashad Bishara, and we have WOW session, which is women around the world of phlebology, Chantal Aguro from Paraguay, Lorino, uh, Lorena Grillo from Costa Rica, and humbly myself, Wasila Taha from Egypt. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asila, for this. Useful, precise presentation. I enjoyed it myself. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to also to, again to encourage the audience to send their questions on the WhatsApp application. You have to scan this uh, QR code by your mobile and send the question. And I will, on your behalf, I will ask the uh, presenters and the speakers your questions. Thank you. I would like to call the, uh, the, uh, the next uh, speaker. Dr. Ahmed Sayed Awad from Egypt, Cairo University, Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank Dr. Ahmed Taha for his invitation, and I'm happy to be with uh, you today. Bismillah rahman rahim uh, uh, My talk about the limitations of the city and geography in the lower uh, limbs, uh, is it still existing? Uh, the peripheral vascular disease increase in diabetes and it usually affects blue knee arteries and cause multiple diffuse lesions. Also, there's increased risk of cerebrovascular stroke, coronary artery disease, nephropathy, and retinopathy. So, for vascular imaging of diabetic patients, we should consider the vascular disease as well as the associated morbidity, especially the nephropathy. CT angiography is frequently used to assess peripheral vascular disease of diabetic foot because it is non-invasive, high resolution, and can generate high quality multiplanar and reformatting and 3D images, can cover longer arter arterial segments, and to provide full information about arterial disease, occlusion, stenosis, injury, and collaterals. Also can assess extra vascular structures and organs. CT has a possible limitations and pitfalls. Uh, includes metallic and beam hardening artifacts from applied plates, screws, and the processes or embolizing materials and cause improper assessment of the vessel element. First case, city uh, of the pelvis uh, in patient with prior embolization of pelvic arteriovenous malformation by multiple calls and causes multiple beam hardening artifacts which may affect the visualization, proper visualization of the artist. In the second case, prior uh, nail fixation of the femur was transverse uh, beam hardening artifact obscuring the artery. 
Dense calcifications in the arterial wall can cause bromic artifacts, which obscure the evaluation of vessel lumen and leading to overestimation of the sinus. In this image, there's extensive calcifications in the aorta encroaching upon the ossea of the celiac, so, celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery, and the renal arteries. Also, lack of dynamic information by the CT angio and patient's exposure to nephrotoxic contrast medium and radiation hazards. However, with development of the dual injury CT, this is expected to overcome the limitations of the standard single injury CT angiography. Dual injury CT is a form of CT in which two X-ray beams are used with each one have different energy of radiation, and so the term dual injury CT. As different materials show difference in the X-ray absorption at different injury levels, we can extract the tissue specific information from the imaging data. It can differentiate between different materials such as iodine, which is in the contrast, and the calcium, which is a thrombus break and the bones, and offer better soft tissue characterization. The advantage is automated bone removal, metallic artifact reduction, reduction of contrast dose with virtual non-contrast imaging, improved characterization of the ionized contrast enhancement with contrast dose reduction better 3D processing, and 4D dynamic images. Regarding the bone removal, bone subtraction techniques in a single injury CT identify bone using the dynasty, technique which is prone to cause arterial subtraction, especially in the vessels close related to the bone. This can result in images with false vessel occlusion. In this image, in the anterior tibial artery is very close to the, the fibula, and when we depend on removal of the bone by the single injury CT, it is possible to remove this part of the anterior tibial and give false impression about uh, occluded segment. In the dual injury, it allows separation of the iodine and the bone pixels based on differentiation in the X-ray absorption at two injury levels, provide subtraction of bone only. This is the same case, case, and we remove the bone without affecting the nearby artery. Break removal, calcified break are ob uh, uh, obscure the vessel lumen on 3D images, making accurate assessment of sinus difficult, depending on different X-ray absorption and different energies, dual energy techniques have the ability to perform automated calcified plaque subtraction and improve luminal visualization. In this case, single injury CT angiography showed significant superficial femoral artery stenosis. With dual injury CT, the calcified plaques are subtracted, allowing proper evaluation and exclude significant stenosis. In this case, oh, okay, okay. In this case uh, uh, the image of a single energy CT and geography showed uh, uh, multiple calcified plaques and was improper uh, or accurate uh, assessment of the patency of the, sub the superficial femoral artery, while in the dual energy CT and geography it confirms the occlusion of superficial femoral arteries with clear demonstration of the occlusion. By using metallic artifact reduction software, we can reduce the metallic artifact, uh, reduce the from the uh, screws or the nail. As is in case, the first uh, image, there is artifact from the, the nail. In the second, after apply the metallic artifact reduction software, the artery is uh, better visualized. In this case of uh, prior embolization of pelvic AVM, after uh, use the metallic artifact reduction, there is, the artery appears more better and the artifacts are reduced. And we do 3D images, volume rendering, and cinematic view, and with proper visualization of the internal iliac branches, and we can assess the site of the uh, residual uh, fistula. We can also, uh, from the dual energy images, we can subtract the iodine, which is the, the contrast within the artery, and to produce visual non-contrast study, without need to repeat through non-contrast scan, and this lead to decrease in the radiation dose by 13%. This patient with endovascular repair of abdo abdominal aneurysm type, with type 2 leak, dual injury images shows the endo leak, 
and visual non-contrast image, so the fine mural calcifications with absence of calcifications at the site of the leak, and the iodine selective images highlight the endo leak. Also, post-processing uh, techniques in the, in the dual energy is better than the single energy. This is the multi-planary formatting, and this is the map images, which uh, provide similar to the conventional uh, angiography and the volume rendering images. And this is a cinematic view, which is like volume rendering, but, but with better 3D reconstruction. And the dynamic 4D images, which provide idea about the flow and the hemodynamics. This is the infrabuchetal vessels with multiple occlusion segmental branches. And this is a dynamic 4D images for endoleak. And this is for AVM and the 4R. Thank you. Thank you for this very nice presentation. I would like to invite the next speaker, Dr. Mohamed Al Maadawi, Cairo University, Egypt. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Ahmed Tan for his uh, invitation. Uh, we have already by the year 2011 uh, around uh, 366 million cases of the diabetic, uh, diabetic patients. And this number is nominated to be 550 cases by the year 2030, which equates to 10% of the world population at that time. The objective management of the diabetic foot ulcer is number one, prevention of the amputation, and number two, is the wound healing, and number three, is preservation of the ampulation of the patient and also his quality of life and his productivity. When we come first for the amputation diabetic foot, the patient with uh, diabetes has the highest risk of uh, amputation, which is uh, uh, 15 to 30 times more likely uh, to uh, develop in diabetic patients more than in the non-diabetic patient. And uh, between 70 to 80 percent of the non-traumatic amputation which are performed are performed in diabetic patients. And uh, patients with diabetic foot ulcer have uh, special consider considerations in uh, this uh, manner as uh, uh, five percent to eight percent of the patient with diabetic foot ulcer uh, uh, could have an amputation during their lifetime. Uh, it is not surprising to uh, say that uh, one million amputations has, are being performed per year, which equates to a limb uh, loss every 20 seconds somewhere in the world. So this problem is of a great concern for the physicians and for the healthcare taker. And also this has its, its implications on the economic loss. As uh, you see, there is a steady money expenditure along uh, with the patients who are diabetic, and this is exponentially increased once the patient develops a diabetic foot ulcer, which uh, subsequently necessitates PTA or bypass, and it reaches the pinnacle of this economic loss when there is an amputation and its consequences on the rehabilitation uh, consequences. Second is the wound healing. The key limiting factor for the wound healing is the blood supply to the area in which the ulcer exists. Uh, they are difficult to estimate at the time being, but uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of techniques have been uh, provided in order to estimate how much of the perfusion is reaching the site of the ulcer. Uh, generally speaking, we have indirect methods for the assessment of uh, that, like the ankle pressure, toe pressure, and their relative indices, the ankle brachial index, and the two uh, brachial index. Uh, this is, has been uh, uh, advocated as uh, a fact that the driving force for the uh, blood flow is the pressure, and if you have measurements of the pressure at a certain uh, site, this will give you an impression about the uh, perfusion at that, uh, at that site. But of course, they are indirect. The direct methods are the transcutaneous oxygen tension, skin perfusion, uh, pressure, and hyperspectral imaging. 
uh, when it comes to the ankle pressure, toe pressure, and their indices, they have a limited prediction of the ulcer healing. But on the other side of the aisle, they have useful uh, uh, things. Uh, for example, they are useful for screening of the lower extremity arterial disease, useful for the follow-up and assessment of effectiveness of uh, a given revascularization method, and also the detection of the failing bypass graft. On the other hand, the transcutaneous oxygen tension or, uh, and the uh, skin perfusion pressure, uh, the direct methods, they have higher sensitivity and specificity when compared to the indirect methods in the protection of the ulcer healing. With the specificity of the highest with the transcutaneous oxygen tension, which reaches up to 81.6% predictions of the ulcer healing. <coughs> Uh, typically, the uh, uh, instrument looks like, uh, looks like that, and the measurements technique uh, is conducted along two uh, methods of, uh, of measurement. Uh, we have the conventional or the gold standard, gold standard methods, which is called the Clark electrode, uh, in the form of a platinum cathode and silver anode covered by thin membrane, which is permeable to the oxygen. The reference values for, uh, for that is it is normal when there is uh, 50 to 70 millimeter mercury of oxygen. It's normal. If it is less than 40 millimeter mercury, there is impaired wheel healing. That's to say you are not expecting that your wound will heal uh, on its own by the repeated dressing and wound care. And if it is below 30 millimeter mercury, it uh, signifies that there is a critical limb ischemia and the necessity for the revascularization. The other message, which depends on the photo optical uh, uh, measurements of the transcutaneous oxygen tension, it is uh, uh, ongoing and its value in the diabetic uh, foot healing has not been established. When we come to the guidelines and the, the uh, clinical applications of uh, that, this is uh, the uh, task two, which was published on 2007. In its recommendations, any patients with diabetic uh, food, who is diabetic and has a diabetic food uh, ulcer, these patients should, in addition to the clinical evaluation, should have an objective uh, uh, measurement for that patient. And also the diagnosis of the critical limb ischemia should not depend on the, on the clinical evaluations, but should be supported by, uh, uh, by objective measures. And uh, the latest uh, global vascular guidelines has mentioned that you have to put this transcutaneous oxygen tensions in your arm diagnostic armamentarium while you are evaluating your, uh, your patients. Uh, to put that into uh, practice, we, if, we, if you have a claudicant patient who is no diabetes, you can uh, uh, do for the, that uh, patient EBI and uh, tread uh, male EBI. And if this patient is diabetic, you can add to the EBI uh, to oppression or the, to uh, obviate or to eliminate the effects of the calcifications of the tibial vessels on its effect on the uh, measurements of the EBI. If this patient is diabetic with a wound, uh, you should add, in addition to uh, that, the transcutaneous oxygen uh, tension, and also the same goes for the critical limb ischemia. So uh, uh, the transcutaneous oxygen tension is helpful in your uh, management of your patient in order to make the decision as an informed decision making, not based on guessing, not to waste the patient time and to patient effort, and you should make the decision objectively. Uh, so you have to confirm your diagnosis and you can choice to choose between conservative management or uh, intervention according to the situation and uh, of course with uh, the uh, uh, aid of the other imaging, for example like the imaging techniques and also it can help you in the assessment of the patient. Uh, very importantly is the determination of the amputation level. We uh, have used to uh, uh, perform the amputation, uh, for example, if there is a popliteal pulse to do for the patient below knee amputation. If we have no popliteal pulse, we have to go for above knee amputations. This uh, can lead to unnecessary above knee amputations, but with the objective measures, you can obviate that and do the right amputation for the right patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed, for this interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I would like to invite the last but not least uh, presenter, Dr. Am uh, Amr Abdel Fattah from Cairo University.
Good morning. Uh, many thanks to Prof. Uh, Ahmad Taha for his nice uh, invitation. So you have a technical problem? Okay, okay, result. The role of the MRI in the assessment of diabetic food complications. Diabetes related food problems like osteomyelitis and charcot neuro uh, osteoarthropathy are associated with a high morbidity and a high health care cost. A red hot food in a patient with diabetic neuropathy is a, is a diagnostic problem. In this overview, we'll focus on two questions. Is this an active charcot or osteomyelitis? Is this a chronic charcot food with superimposed infection or not? Technical considerations. In MRI protocol, we localize the ulcer or sinus with a marker we, using a high-resolution surface coil, small, uh, small field of view MRI. Uh, T1 and the stair images are very important, especially sagittal, midfoot, plantar surface, calcaneus, parallel to the toes, metatarsophalangeal joints, and the interpharyngeal joints are very important. Contrast is used to better depict devitalized regions, abscesses, uh, sinus tracts uh, or and joint or tendon involvement. Uh, here's a diagram show the difference between osteomyelitis and the active charcot. Osteomyelitis is a bone disease, so it is very important to, to check the ulcer site and follow the ulcer uh, ulcer tract, uh, sinus tract, and then the underlying osseous changes, especially in calcaneous bone. MRI show uh, uh, marrow edema, which is characteristic for osteomyelitis. Uh, active charcot. Charcot is a joint disease. Joint disease occur in the midfoot, especially. No skin defects, no, uh, no uh, joint deformity. Uh, actually, it rapidly progressed to chronic charcot. In chronic charcot, uh, the joint is totally disrupted, dislocated, and there is uh, defragment, uh, defragment, uh, debris or loose bodies because the joint is fragmented. However, in superimposed infection, there is flattening of the plantar arch, uh, so the cuboid will sag uh, and appear as a pressure point, so it uh, will ulcerate, or the overlying skin is ulcerating, so uh, the sinus tract uh, appeared and the superimposed infection uh, can occur. Again, osteomyelitis is uh, a disease of bone, so it occurs at the site of uh, at the pressure points, uh, actually, it's more important in the hind, hind foot or forefoot. In the hind foot, typically occur uh, be, uh, specifically in the calcaneus bone. In the forefoot, uh, typically occur at the site of the uh, metatarsal and phalanges. Uh, again, you should mark the site of ulcer, uh, follow the sinus track and the underlying osseous changes. These MRI images, uh, T1, STIR, and post contrast. Uh, in, uh, in, in STIR, you can find the sinus tract annotated by blue arrow, which is specific for osteomyelitis and the underlying bony changes. Uh, in contrast, it's very important because the tract is enhancing. Uh, the diagram show the joint is well aligned, so it's not chronic charcot, it's active charcot. Uh, you should look for ulcer or sinus tracts, no sinus tracts or defects. Uh, typically, the location of the active charcot occurs at the midfoot. 
This X-ray, the first image shows a well alignment of the joint in active charcot, uh, no deformity. However, in the second image showed uh, flattening of the plantar arch, sagging of the cuboid, which is typical uh, appearance of rocker bottom deformity. The fragmentation of the joints is very important. Uh, it's specific in chronic charcot joint. Uh, this X-ray, it's actually normal, uh, well aligned joint, no uh, skin defects. Uh, in MRI sagittal stair images, uh, marrow edema occur in the mid foot, in the mid uh, tarsal, overlying there is soft tissue edema and underlying uh, muscular edema, no skin defects, there is no osteomyelitis, only active charcot joint. Again, this X-ray, shows a typical appearance of chronic charcot joint. There is disruption between the first and second metatarsal, uh, disruption of the least frank ligament. Uh, uh, subsequent, there is lateral dislocation of the fourth metatarsal in least frank fracture dislocation, chronic charcot osteoneurops, osteoarthropes. Again, uh, the MRI images, T1, T1 with post contrast and the stair images in chronic charcot joint, there is disruption of the joint Maru edema, no skin defects, is a chronic charcot without infection. Uh, in, the in sagittal T1, sagittal uh, stir and T1 post contrast, uh, there is flattening of the plantar arch, sagging of the cuboid, becomes a pressure be to be a pressure point, ulcerate, uh, ulcerated skin. You follow the ulcer in annotated red uh, arrow, uh, underlying sinus tract and this characteristic in stir images marrow edema, so it is a chronic charcot with, over, uh, with super added uh, osteomyelitis. Uh, here in the X-ray, the typical appearance of charcot in the flattening of the plantar, or, uh, plantar arch, with dislocation of the joint, uh, you should find in X-ray the central lucency in the mid plantar arch indicating the ulcer, which is usually the leading point to osteomyelitis. Uh, this stir and the T1 post contrast image shows a uh, the typical appearance of chronic charcot with disruption of the joint articular relations. Uh, the role of contrast is very important because in this case, you, if you follow the blunter, uh, blunter region, you, sh you, sh uh, you can find a high stir soft tissue edema uh, signal. However, in post contrast image, uh, no contrast uh, in a healing sinus tract, so it is a chronic, uh, chronic charcot joint without osteomyelitis, uh, without infection. Uh, take home message, uh, in diabet diabetic food is very important. You should uh, comment in two, two questions. The, uh, the first question, there is osteomyelitis or not? Osteomyelitis is a bone disease, however, charcot joint is a joint disease. You should differentiate between active charcot and the chronic charcot. In active charcot, uh, the joint is well aligned, no disruption, no skin defects. In chronic charcot, there is dist uh, destruction of the joint articular relations, fragmentation, uh, loose bodies. Uh, also, you can, you, you can find in chronic charcot subarticular edema. edema. Marrow edema is not specific for osteomyelitis. The most specific for osteomyelitis is the presence of skin defects, sinus tracts. Uh, post contrast MRI is very important because the enhancement of the sinus tracts is very important. You can delineate the sinus tract and follow it until the underlying bone marrow changes. Thank you. Thank you, Ram, for this nice presentation. Now we finished our session. We will now go to the uh, questions. Uh, I would like to invite all the speakers here to the stage, please. Start, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I will start with the first speaker, Dr. Marx. You have two similar questions from Dr. Hani Zaid and Dr. Ahmed Gawish. They are asking about the efficiency of, ultra, of uh, duplex ultrasound in examination of the foot plantar arches and the vessels. It's reliable or not? We don't have any study to um, you know, give you some numbers about the uh, foot uh, arch assessment uh, because uh, we, our surgeons in the team were mostly doing bypasses to the plantar arteries and uh, 
duplex ultrasound is very sensitive in assessing the uh, common plantar and plantar bifurcation and the salus pedis and a, a lateral tarsal uh, branch. This probably was the limit of the bypasses in our team and that's what we're concentrating on. And because of its uh, superficial location, uh, it's uh, fairly easy to find them unless the patient has extreme obesity and you, um, you cannot really, you limit it by the depth. But if you cannot, if the, you cannot visualize the artery um, because of excess calcification, yes. we found that the bypass also would not be feasible uh, technically. So uh, ultrasound could uh, reliably identify arteries of one millimeter and even less millimeter, but bypasses to the arteries that are less than one millimeter would just not work. So that's why. Thank you. Can I accept this question to Dr. Wasila to uh, listen about her opinion? Thank you, Professor Kapos. Yes, it's very interesting, by the way, Dr. Henny. Thank you for the question. And uh, also have in the fact, now we are, uh, we're trying to ex extrapolate uh, much more information, much, much, much more details from the duplex scan. And of course, as you know, it's a triad. So the patient, the operator, and the machine. If the th <coughs> three triad and these conditions are favorable, so you are, have a high quality of duplex, yes, the answer is yes. We can go below the, the ankle level and we can trace the plantar, uh, plantar artery. And in the vast majority, they are, there is a certain morphological distribution. So even even if the PTA is uh, occluded, very vast majority of the patients will have a spare uh, plantar, uh, plantar artery. And on the other hand, for the ATA, in fact, if the ATA is totally occluded, you have the stump, as, you, as I, I showed in my presentation, as well as the dorsal speeds. So it's, a, it's a, about an operator, the machine, and the patient itself. And another point may be with calculation of the Doppler spectrum at the ankle level. If you have high resistance flow or uh, high RI, this, it will reflect that you have a foot with dessert, dessert foot with no a lot of uh, collateralization and vice versa. If you have a good diastolic component, it, it could reflect that it's, uh, the foot is, uh, you can see in, uh, the, in your catheter lab, a good uh, collateralization in this foot. And thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have many questions. Dr. Maadawi, you have a uh, striking, interesting <laughs> presentation from Dr. Gawish, Dr. Hani Zaid, and many anonymous uh, 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 audience. They ask about the efficiency of the transcutaneous uh, oxygen tension in management of the patients. Um, maybe phrase some uh, questions. Yeah, ask about the efficiency and uh, if there is any um, uh, uh, occlusions in the proximal levels like popliteal and we find that the pressure is... Uh, overall, about the efficiency and the gold standard, uh, where do you uh, com uh, compare the oxygen tension uh, measurements to a gold standard? What is your gold standard of... Uh, uh, think of the specificity and uh, of this uh, kind of study. Uh, yes, we have, uh, we have to distinguish things from, uh, from each other. This is an uh, additive uh, tool for uh, your better management of, uh, of your patient. Uh, Sometimes you uh, find there is a patient with an ulcer in his, uh, in his lower limb. He uh, does not uh, 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 fall into the category of critical limb ischemia nor the category of the claudication of the patient. And you can see this, uh, this patient, and you, your judgment is uh, why to uh, do for him a, a full revascularization for this patient. Uh, another opinion could, uh, could, could be, if uh, it, is, it doesn't look uh, to be uh, much of ischemia is existing, and this ulcer would heal with uh, a conventional wound care. Uh, this is a trial and error uh, technique. If, if, uh, if, if you have an objective measurement to have uh, a decision which is informed decision making based on objective measurements, you can say, no, this patient is for repeated dressing and it will heal, or the other patient will, uh, will, will not heal. This is, this is number one. Number two, it does not obviate your, your conventional methods of assessment of your patient and it does not ruin your indications for revascularization of any patient. But you can anticipate what is going on, and if you uh, need an additive uh, enhancement of the perfusion, it will be ready uh, to take the decision, for example, for the uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy or not, to put for the patients on the VEC therapy or not. Uh, this is, you 
can make these judgments on an objective measures rather than by arbitration and by guessing. And you, you might fail at the end of the day. Also from Dr. Rashad, they're asking about the negative and positive results. So we have uh, many neg false negative or false positives. False negative, they, uh, they, they're, they're us claiming of uh, some of the drawbacks for, uh, for, uh, for this technique. Uh, the uh, uh, first, uh, first, first of all, sometimes it gives a false uh, measurements if there is an infection or if there is an edema of, uh, of the patient. Uh, but this is uh, uh, not a, a real problem if uh, you exert uh, the uh, uh, protocol of the, the technique which is obviated through uh, giving the patient oxygen challenge. You can differentiate between the false results are the results of infection uh, or not. And on calls, uh, also in cases of the edema, you can repeat your uh, test in uh, different positions of uh, the patient leg and you can have a uh, good interpretation for the measurements of the patient. In addition to that, you can uh, do at the same uh, time what's called the uh, uh, regional perfusion index with an, 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 an another probe to be put all over the sternum and you can make uh, an index for the patient himself. And from this, uh, from this index, you can judge about uh, the uh, results in order to make it uh, as accurate as you want. So Dr. Hani Zaid uh, added a question. Is the edema, did it compromise the study if you have edema? Yes, yes, of course. This is uh, one of the limitations for that is uh, to have the edema, but, and also if you put your, uh, your measurement tool over a bony prominence, this is, uh, could be uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a problem. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, also, as I uh, have said uh, to you, you, you uh, uh, can repeat your measurements in different limb positions that can uh, obviate the effect of the edema on that. Uh, part. Thank you for this answers. I have a personal question to Dr. Amr uh, about how we can, can we do a contrast enhanced uh, CT angiography to uh, a patient complaining of uh, renal disease or having a nephropathy? Because uh, I think all the audience is uh, CT, uh, CT, sorry. Okay. Uh, to do uh, a contrast enhanced CT angiography to patients suffering from renal disease or having any renal compromise, do we recommend to do it or? Uh, According to the Kiriat level, if uh, it is uh, high, uh, high normal or normal, we can do uh, dual injury CT angiography. Uh, because uh, in the dual injury CT angiography, uh, we decrease, uh, we need uh, less amount of contrast as compared to the single energy CT. Uh, as in the single energy CT, usually we uh, inject about 100 uh, milli contrast. Uh, in the dual injury, less than uh, 100 mirage to uh, 50 uh, uh, CC. Uh, but if the creat level uh, is high, uh, we, uh, we don't uh, inject uh, contrast uh, unless it is a critical uh, or uh, in special situations uh, uh, when Doppler cannot find the critical So we can finding. do it in a patient with high creatine level. You ca don't recommend to ask for CT angiography with contrast to uh, high, high, high creatine. Yes, yes. And we can do, do, don't do it without contrast. Yes. Yes, okay. So, uh, the other, uh, do you recommend other uh, modalities? MRE. MRE. MRE without contrast. Without contrast. Or Doppler. Do yes. <laughs> Free Doppler specialist. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the last question uh, from the audience is from an enormous uh, audience to Dr. Ramr. Uh, say good morning. Very rare to diagnose acute charcoal joints and to initially request MRI first. So, when to, uh, to, to order MRI the patients? Our Actually, it's true in uh, you to, uh, to diagnose uh, active charcot in early stage. It's very rare because the active charcot rapidly progressed in uh, chronic charcot. Yes. Okay, but uh, if you do MR, if you do X-ray, it appears completely normal because yes. the joint is well aligned, preserved with the skin surface, no skin ulcers. So it's uh, active charcot or not. Yes. You pr we proceed uh, clinically. The patient has red hot food we proceed to another modality. The other modality is MRI. Mm -hmm. MRI, we find in the mid-foot specifically, mid-foot marrow edema, no skin defects, so we are excluding the osteomyelitis. Yes. Uh, also, osteomyelitis is a bone disease, mm -hmm. specific in a single bone, okay? Uh, however, in active charcot, you find the edema 
in opposing the articular surface. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's rare uh, to, to consider it, but uh, you, we can find, uh, find this uh, entity so in MRI in early stage by... Uh, so you by propose to order MRI to every patient having the symptoms you uh, have said, or How when to, when to symptom, order an MRI symptom, to the patient? The symptom, the symptom is uh, common. Yes. Red, hot food, and, diabe and yes. diabetes. It's so a when, problem. So it's when to problem. order MRI? You should answer two questions. Yes. The first question is to osteomyelitis or not. The second question is active shortcut yes. or chronic shortcut. Chronic mm -hmm. shortcut, another problem, it's super added infection or not. In super added infection, you should look for the pressure points, ulcer defects, sinus tracts, enhancement of the sinus tracts is important. Underlying bone marrow edema or osseous changes is typical for osteomyelitis on top of chronic shortcut. So shortcut. order MRI then. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will thank all the speakers for this uh, kind and uh, nice presentations. I would like to call the moderator of the next session, Dr. Ehab Hanna, to come here on the stage. Mm -hmm.